The oral questions put by members to ministers, the Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last year, uh, the Health Authority decided to embark on a new strategy to recruit family doctors and specialists to our province. In a statement of work from the Health Authority, it said, quote, moving from nine districts uh, recruiting for open positions to one province with four recruitment zones has been challenging, and I will uh, table that uh, for the House. In a nutshell, this document admits amalgamating the health districts has made the doctor shortage in our province worse. So my question to the Premier is, if moving from nine districts to one health authority has made it harder to recruit badly needed doctors, why did this government decide to forge ahead anyway? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I think what he's missing in that report, and I think what all Nova Scotians know, was the fractured system that we had before, the inaction of former Ministers of Health when it came to ensuring that we had the appropriate efficient resource recruitment centre. Uh, I didn't say all of them, I just said some former ones. I didn't say all of them. So, so uh, I, I just said, and what we've recognized now under a single system, we can now continue to move on to ensure that we have the right complement of uh, 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 people together to ensure that as physicians retire, uh, we can replace them across our province. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Nova Scotia has seen a net loss of doctors. Uh, we have a doctor shortage. Mr. Speaker, you would think government would be doing everything in their power to make it easy for, unqualified, or for qualified doctors to move here and set up a practice. Unfortunately, a doctor is helping Nova Scotia uh, helping Nova Scotia recruit physicians from the UK calls the process to come to Nova Scotia fiendishly difficult, and I will table that. It's a fully complexity of bureaucracy and language that's used by the administrative places here, the colleges, is a language that is not immediately understood. Uh, this physician says he knows of at least four people who opted to go to BC, Australia, New Zealand after trying to navigate the Nova Scotia system. My question to the Premier would be that it, he needs to admit that until the government gets serious about knocking down the barriers that prevent doctors from coming to Nova Scotia, that a marketing strategy is simply window dressing. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think the doctor he's referring to is Dr. Bonington, Mr. Speaker, who actually came to Nova Scotia, I believe, when he was Minister of Health. I want to assure him uh, we tore down those barriers, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing great results from our relationship with the UK. Uh, three physicians are on the way and more to come. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I don't know if the Premier knows this, but International Women's Day has its roots in strikes and marches. I'm sure if the Premier had been in charge back then, he would have legislated against it and them. Those strikes were for decent wages, shorter hours, and health and safety. These are women's issues. The Premier's record on women is keeping women's wages down, denying women's right to strike, and denying women's freedom to associate. That's what bill after bill has done to home support workers, care and health workers, nurses, frontline government workers, and teachers. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier admit that his government's actions have disproportionately harmed women? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I want to remind her, Mr. Speaker, through the entire process when it came to ensuring that we provided and supported all public sector workers, Mr. Speaker, not a single person lost any money in our government, Mr. Speaker. What we did was slow down the growth in the wages. I also want to remind the Honourable Member the investments we made, the great announcement we actually made in her riding yesterday, which was a pre-primary program, which we all know is getting our wives and daughters back into the workforce quickly, Mr. Speaker. I, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure she would have gone to the event that happened the day before when the Honourable Member talked about the amount of investments we made in affordable child care to ensuring that families, both men and women, can get back into the workforce to continue to provide for their families. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure she would also recognize the sooner that our, that, our, that our wives and daughters get back into the workforce, they continue to build their pensions, they continue to work to make sure that they build their careers, they continue to grow, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of our record, Mr. Speaker, and I want to remind the Honourable Member, when her party had a chance, they appointed nine of ten people to the bench that were men, Mr. Speaker. This government ensured a gender equality. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South on her final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, the Premier's response is interesting but saddening because there is so much his government could do for women, so much more. One step would be to get with the times and raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. The majority of Nova Scotians making minimum wage are women, 56%, and I can table that. A $15 minimum wage would make a dramatic difference for women like Simone Maillet. She worked for nearly 41 years in a cafeteria in Church Point. She is making $14.07 an hour. As she said, in those 41 years, everything has gone up but her wages. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier mark International Women's Day by committing to the women in this province that there will be a $15 minimum wage by 2020? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again, thank the Honourable for the question. I'm very proud of the work uh, this government did, ensuring that we uh, changed uh, the guaranteed income supplement, that we made sure uh, the basic personal exemption, sorry, that we made sure uh, low-income Nova Scotians were receiving the biggest benefit of that tax cut, the largest single tax cut in the history of our province. <laughs> I want to remind the Honourable Member to continue to work with my colleagues around Atlantic Canada to ensure that we continue to build an environment in this, pro in this province where all workers are treated fairly. Uh, and I want to also remind the Honourable Member that the minimum wage being set in this province is being set by a formula that was set by the NDP. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In July of 2015, the government released a review of the 2006 Continuing Care Strategy. One of the last sentences of the review is, quote, these findings together with the continued engagement of stakeholders will then inform the development of our five-year continuing care strategy set for release in 2017. Now, I know, Mr. Speaker, as we get older, it seems the years go by quicker, but we're 2018 already. Mr. Speaker, 2017 has come and gone, and we have yet to see the continuing care strategy. Nova Scotia is one of the oldest populations in the country, and in the next five years, it's estimated that 22% of our population will be over the age of 65. This is not the time to drag our feet on this issue. Will the Premier admit that he's letting seniors and their families down by promising a continuing care strategy that he has failed to deliver? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, in that question, there's a huge assumption, Mr. Speaker, that when you turn 65, you're automatically old and need long-term care, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the Honourable Member, as I uh, just had a resolution read by the member from Digby, Claire Digby, about uh, his amazing mother, I think at 87, who's now doing tremendous work, and I want to uh, the minister of, uh, who's responsible for seniors, community culture and heritage has worked with organizations across the province that would continue to provide an opportunity for people to age in place, uh, to continue not uh, to age to, so they can end up long-term care, but age to be in active living, Mr. Speaker, and that's the wonderful thing. Uh, and he's a great example, no offense, Minister, uh, <laughs> of what happens when you continue to look after yourself and age in place. But I also want to remind you all my member when it comes to long-term care, we continue to invest We've continued to invest in home care. We've continued to respond to what Nova Scotians have told us, Mr. Speaker, and they require assistance uh, for, for medical reasons, for support to live in their home. They want to be able to stay in their home as long as possible, and we've made tremendous investment in doing just that. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. I know the, the Premier wants to give us examples of, of everybody that's well and can stay at home, which is great for them. But we get phone calls from thousands of Nova Scotians who are sitting in a hospital bed waiting for long-term care placement. We have thousands of Nova Scotians that continue to call our offices that are going 100 kilometers away from their homes to get to a long-term care facility or at least a basic uh, long-term care placement. That's unacceptable way to treat Nova Scotians, the seniors that have given so much to our communities. My question to the Minister, or to the Premier is, 2017 it was promised that we'd have a continuing care strategy that would start to look at some of these issues. When will we be expecting that strategy? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the Honourable Member. It's unacceptable. That's why when he was Minister and there were 2,500 people on the list, we now get it down to 1,000, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to work with those families to provide those long-term care and provide support, Mr. Speaker. And we're going to continue to work, and we're going to continue to work, and we're going to continue to work with those... Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, one of... Mr. Speaker, one of the things about being in this house long enough, we all got records to stand on, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pretty happy to stand on mine, Mr. Speaker, and I'll compare it to that one at any time. But the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to work with those seniors who tell us they want to stay in their home as long as possible. It's why we've continued to make and work with them, and we'll continue to make sure that we provide a myriad of options for long-term care and for those citizens who require it. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the minister responsible for the status of women. 
At the end of March, provincial grants to sexual assault crisis service providers for trauma and forward counselling will expire. I've spoken to a number of these uh, staff and volunteers, uh, workers who support survivors of sexual violence, and they're worried, Mr. Speaker. They're worried about what will happen once this funding disappears. With decreased, uh, decreased resources, most centres will not be able to meet the demand for these crucial supports. So I'd like to request of the Minister today, would she take a look at it, and on behalf of these centres, could she please guarantee that the funding won't dry up after March 31st? The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. I want to thank the Honourable Member for raising this very important question, Mr. Speaker. When those sexual violence grants were given out, they were indicated they would be uh, for a, a finite term. Uh, however, we have heard what the community is saying, and we are, we are taking a look at the exact issue she is raising. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And while I do appreciate the work that's been done through the province's sexual assault strategy, uh, the current, the culturally relevant supports that are provided by the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre, for, for instance, are really essential. And the community-based therapeutic counselling services in Lunenburg, Queens, are needed to meet a growing demand. Also in Amherst, the sexual assault centre there. So across the province, we really need to be expanding these services and not cutting them. So will the Minister please commit to permanent funding for these essential services for survivors of sexual violence? The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question and her, her passion around this particular issue, Mr. Speaker. And I want to um, also, you know, quite frankly, thank the, the women throughout this House who have raised issues like this with me. I want to assure all of them that in the coming budget we will be taking a hard look at everything that we can possibly do to support victims of violence. I would note that uh, for, for uh, our colleagues here, there is an online free program that you can take uh, that will help you better support a victim victims of violence, of sexual violence online, and I'd be happy to share the, uh, the information on that with anyone if they want to approach me afterwards. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Transportation, Infrastructure, Renewal. On Monday, the province announced that it had opened the tap on the 25-year uh, Nova Centre lease. When the project was announced, the province's commitment was $58.9 million. This week's announcement articulated an annual payment of $5,380,000 plus an additional monthly operating fee of $82,000. So if you get your pencil out, $5,380,000 plus an additional million um, uh, for, the, for, the annual, for the operating fee times 25 years, that's $159 million dollars. So my question for the minister is, can the minister please explain, please explain how $58.9 million commitment put forward by the province has now, now has the province on the hook for almost $160 million. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And recently I was very pleased to uh, uh, conclude the substantial completion of the uh, uh, Nova Centre which uh, is one of the best investments that a government has ever made in this province. It will pay dividends overall. It came in actually uh, on budget with the exception for one uh, agreed upon uh, re revision uh, requested by Events East, which was done to enhance the capability of the convention centre. It's on a fixed financing cost at an incredibly good interest rate due to the great management from the people who are looking after it in my department. And Nova Scotians will see this uh, to persevere as one of the best investments we have ever made. The Honourable Member for Picto East. $60 million into $160 million, that's the type of investment that uh, financial planners dream of. Under, but unfortunately, those financial planners are on the other side of this transaction from the taxpayers. In addition, the, the, the Nova Centre was almost two years late in opening. 22 events had been booked for 2017. All of them had to be moved. Um, and when we look at $60 million into 100 
and 60 million. I heard the minister say that it was uh, pretty much on budget and on time. We're hearing that about the, the QE2 redevelopment too. The CEO of the Health Authority said, don't worry, it'll be on time on budget, but there is no budget or timeline for that project. So can the minister, can the minister tell the House, was there any uh, financial penalties or any penalties to the developer as a result of being two years late on the completion? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the numbers that the member is, is quoting uh, is our, our gross numbers that the, the participation by the province is in is in the uh, 58.9 million dollar range uh, for the period of the lease. It's paid out in monthly installments over a period of time, and uh, the lease payment is split between HRM and the province. Uh, in terms of the value uh, to uh, the province, we're expecting events to attract in the vicinity of 80,000 uh, visitors a year into, this, uh, into the province of Nova Scotia. The convention centre is a provincial facility. It will attract people into uh, uh, the entirety of the province. We're, we have a great uh, uh, appeal in, in North America, in, in the Nova Scotia and in Halifax, and we have a secret weapon that brings people here, and that's our lobsters. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Education. The Minister has stated uh, that as part of his department's administrative reform, he intends to provide for more local decision-making. Part of that local decision-making includes empowering the school advisory councils. During a media scrum on Monday, the Minister indicated that SACs will be given dollars they can spend in their school communities. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister of Education clarify how much funding he anticipates will be put at the discretion of the School Advisory Councils? The thank Honourable you, Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, as indicated and consistent with the recommendations that came forward from the Glaze Report, the dollars that will be dispersed will be reflective of the dollars saved from uh, eliminating one level of governance in the education system. I do not have a number right now in terms of which, uh, what, the, what the envelope will be for each school, but we do need to develop uh, an equitable way of, of delivering those funds uh, so that uh, our school communities, our teachers, principals, parents, community members uh, can actually invest in areas where they believe are important for the school community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, school advisory councils play a vital role in our school system. They are a place where educators, parents and the larger community can come together to help integrate our schools into their neighbourhoods. Uh, these are volunteer boards, Mr. Speaker, or at least they have been up until now. The Minister has made it clear that these uh, SACs will now receive public funds to spend. I don't need to remind this government, Mr. Speaker, that when public funds are available, all of a sudden, friends come out of the woodwork. My question is this, Mr. Speaker. Is the minister prepared to turn the operation of school advisory elections over to Elections Nova Scotia to ensure that they are fair and protected? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if that step would be necessary at this point. Uh, we are following the recommendation to review the selection process uh, for SAC members and the mandate, but as the member said, we want more people to come out and involve themselves in SACs. Uh, we have communities where we don't have the participation that we like. We're hoping that by uh, ensuring that they have a bit more authority in their own school community to, di to spend funds in areas that they believe are important, that will actually encourage more people to participate. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health was recently asked by a CBC reporter, can all Nova Scotians ex still expect a family physician for every citizen? And I noticed that he didn't actually answer that question, but rather he alluded to the reporter that collaborative care clinics will now be able to take care of all the health care needs of Nova Scotians. Can the Minister of Health please clarify, is this government no longer planning to ensure every citizen has a family physician? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the member for bringing the question. Happy to clarify uh, that uh, what I said was indeed that 
uh, the work that's ongoing and our efforts as a province to expand our recruitment uh, to uh, physicians uh, for primary care services, uh, family physicians, general practitioners to the province of Nova Scotia is ongoing. We have a number of initiatives that uh, we're taking around uh, recruitment incentives, expanding our residency programs, uh, changes to our immigration streams to make it easier to recruit those physicians. So uh, our commitment there uh, remains, Mr. Speaker, but also that uh, what Nova Scotians are, are really looking for is access to primary care services in their communities when they need it, Mr. Speaker. And we believe collaborative care practices, bringing together other uh, health care professionals to work with those physicians, is an important part of that strategy forward. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Well, it looks like he's eluding my question, the same as he eluded the, the uh, reporters. The question was, will this government be in still ensuring that every Nova Scotian has a family physician? And my concern, Mr. Speaker, is that we're actually creating another level of bureaucracy with the collaborative care clinics. I was contacted, and some of my colleagues as well have similar stories. I was contacted by a mother who called to be seen, her daughter was sick, and was seen by a nurse practitioner. And a couple weeks later, that same mother called and then was told, this daughter no longer has a family physician and has to see the nurse practitioner. So I, I again will ask the Minister of Health, will his government be ensuring every Nova Scotian will have access to a family physician? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the work in the collaborative practice, Mr. Speaker, does not uh, preclude uh, access to family physicians. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the goal and the, and the work here is uh, obviously centered around the premise of being collaborative. That is, a variety of health care professionals uh, working to their scope of practice, Mr. Speaker, to provide the care that is needed by Nova Scotians to make sure they're seen by the right health care professional at the right time. Mr. Speaker, that means working with our family physicians as well as our nurses uh, and other health care professionals to provide the care Nova Scotians need and deserve. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> my question is for the Minister of Education. My colleague, the member for Dartmouth North, recently had an opportunity in the Community Services Committee to ask the Executive Director of the Advisory Council on the Status of Women if government legislation was examined through a gender lens before it is brought forward. Her response was yes that re for reports and recommendations that go to cabinet, there is a checkbox that says, has a gender analysis been done? And any department putting that forward would look at whether they have done a true gender analysis and check it off. And I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, will the minister table the gender analysis done on his pro proposed reforms to education? The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. I want to thank the honourable member for the question and um, the uh, the response that was given at that committee is indeed correct. There is a gender analysis. Each each uh, piece of legislation that goes through the house is in fact uh, you can do a gen gender analysis on that. There's a place for that. Training has taken place for that, Mr. Speaker. But we don't yet have GBA plus, Mr. Speaker. And I think that's what the honourable member is speaking about. And we are examining that issue even as we speak. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. I take from that answer that a gender analysis has not been done, and I would request that the gender analysis be tabled before this legislation goes forward. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about the impact on half the population, so I sincerely hope the minister did check off that box. It's not the first time this government has forced through legislation that targets women. A little over a year ago, this government stripped the collective bargaining rights of about 6,000 women working in public education, and now, just in time for International Women's Day, the minister is eliminating the only level of elected government with gender parity, and the value of these women is not as wives or mothers primarily, but as elected officials. Negative impacts on the women of Nova Scotia must not be written off as unintended consequences of bad legislation. Mr. Speaker, will the minister take what may be his very last chance to admit that these reforms negatively impact women and go back to the department for further analysis and consultation? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I do reject the premise of the question that this government has attacked women. I do not think that is a fair or accurate depiction of any policies that this government has moved forward with. And I will, I will note that while I sympathize with the arguments being presented by the members opposite around the democratic institution of school boards, I must say that the institution of the education system is not here for those folks. They're not here, it's not here for us, it's here for the students. And I will note for this House that that party has not mentioned students once in this line of questioning. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. 
Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Mr. Speaker, the five-year plan is an important document that provides clarity and direction as to where and when <coughs> projects will take place. Unfortunately, getting on that plan has proven very difficult. Many residents of my constituency use Old Route 5 in Big Bedore as an example of what's wrong in our paving strategy. These residents claim that before the last provincial election, they were told that department, departmental officials considered work on this road high priority and that it would be included in the five-year highway improvement plan. But sadly, I can't find it in the plan. So, Mr. Speaker, my question through you to the Minister. Will the Minister explain why such a road as this continues to be delayed even though it's considered to be a priority for his department. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I must say that the uh, five-year plan is an excellent tool in uh, prioritizing and bringing some sensible management into the way that uh, road business is conducted in the province. Uh, we uh, rely on the advice of our professionals who uh, are engineers, who determine what uh, the requirement is in the uh, area. And uh, with uh, the, the 24,000 kilometers of roads we have in the province, we can't do them all at the same time, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the residents of Victoria the Lakes are grateful for any work being done, although much more is required. Work is taking place along the Cabot Trail in places like Inganish that is cost-shared with the federal government but included in the overall totals for Victoria the Lakes. This road is a vital part of our tourism industry because of the many bus tour operators and tourists that travel this road during the tourist season to appreciate the scenic views. So my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister is since the Cabot Trail project is one that is cost-shared, can the savings from these projects, because of, the, uh, because of that, be applied to more road paving in Victoria the Lakes. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, we, uh, you know, it's hard not to be grateful for the uh, excellent work that Parks Canada is doing within the Cape Breton Highlands Park on their own ticket. Uh, and uh, that's a great compliment to what we are uh, doing. The work that we're doing outside of the uh, parks is not cost-shared and is uh, done by uh, the uh, department solely. And uh, in recognition of the excellent upgrades that are occurring within the park, uh, we are uh, targeting quite a bit of the Cabot Trail in this year's budget in Victoria the Lakes. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Education. In a continuously changing environment, securing life skills is a critical part of being able to meet the challenges of everyday life. Young students often lack skills, such as the ability to deal with stress and frustration. Presently in our high schools, they touch on some life skills and a grade 10 course, Math at Work. Questions to the Minister. Does the Minister believe we should have a compulsory course for high school students which covers certain aspects of life skills? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. In terms of enhancing our curriculum, that is an ongoing uh, process, and we're always willing to take uh, suggestions from members opposite, members of the public, and in particular, our, our, in particular, our educators, whom we are actually going to include more in the development of our curriculum, Mr. Speaker. So if the, uh, if the member does have any suggestions on how to enhance that curriculum, I'd be very happy to ensure that those are considered during that process. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. I have all kinds of suggestions, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Do I have the time? Uh, Mr. Speaker, a grade 10 career development covers life skills. However, this course is an elective. Grade 10 students have a choice of selecting only two electives. Guidance counselors continue to tell me the difficulty arises when assisting students because they often lack the basic skills necessary to build confidence. They have difficulty analyzing options, making decisions, and simply completing applications for post-secondary institutions. My question for the Minister, will the Minister consider making grade 10 career development a compulsory course, giving students the opportunity to learn about tax returns, Canada Savings Funds, 
debt associated with credit cards and basic daily bills. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member and I are in agreement that those are necessary skills to be <coughs> successful in life after school. Um, I do not have the ability to unilaterally make decisions on curriculum. We do have a process for that. We are also ensuring that we involve more educators in that process, but uh, I can say at first glance, I do not think this idea is a bad one. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. The Rainbow Bridge has been closed since December the 11th. It's 87 days over 12 weeks. The road that is the detour is now broken down and that will cost tens of thousands of dollars to repair. Mr. Speaker, in the private sector, an engineering report would take no longer than three weeks to obtain. I would like to direct the, a question to the Minister. Why, after 12 weeks, is there still no engineering report and that needs to be completed to determine is the bridge need to be replaced or repaired and no timeline of when this work will be completed? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, <clears throat> as a member opposite in the House would re uh, recognize, our primary consideration in the department is the safety of motorists in uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, that's what led to the decision uh, on the rigorous inspection that is done of our bridges to determine that there were some uh, failure in some of the members, supporting members at the bridge, and kicked in the process to determine what work had to be done to, re to either replace or repair the bridge repair the bridge. And we have asked for a uh, consultant's report on that, and we await that. We expect to have it this month. Mr. Uh, the Speaker. Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, there's no reason why the taxpayers of Nova Scotia should accept that something takes more than four times longer in the public sector than it does <clears throat> in the private sector. Can the Minister of Transportation please take some responsibility for leading his department and demand some accountability for the taxpayers of Nova Scotia and Cumberland County. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud of the people who labour every day, the 2,200 people that work for our department, and, and their, their accountability is, uh, is, is extensive and they do not uh, uh, take anything in, in, uh, lightly. Uh, they're working diligently, diligently on this. Uh, there are 4,200 bridges in the province, and certainly the highways and bridges in, in uh, uh, Cumberland County get the same attention as they do in the other 17 counties in Nova Scotia. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, according to data from the Nova Scotia Finance and Treasury Board in 2017, the majority of low-wage workers in our province were women. <coughs> Women represent 100% of people employed in six of the 10 lowest paying occupations, and there are no women at all in five of the 10 top highest paid jobs. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister of Labour, will the Minister explain what he is doing to increase women's wages? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. One thing, Mr. Speaker, I'm doing is I've actually empowered the committee that looks at minimum wage to actually look at what our minimum wages is, are in Nova Scotia, to actually go outside of the rules that were set by the NDP, again, Mr. Speaker, set by the NDP on what the, way, what the minimum wage increase could be every year, which was minimum, which was inflation. So, Mr. Speaker, the committee sent me a letter, and I looked at the letter, and I said, I will give you the authority to go and look at what our minimum wage is, to look at where it should be, Mr. Speaker, I will say one thing. When we look at Ontario, Alberta, $15 minimum wage, they have full employment. They have higher cost of living. When you look at New York, Seattle, who are going to $15 minimum wage, they're going in 2022. So, Mr. Speaker, one thing I will not do is sit there without any data, and I've asked the NDP to provide any data of how Nova Scotia can have a $15 minimum wage, and without that data, how can we go there and actually have the people who we're trying to help lose their jobs? Because that's what would happen, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with all due respect, we would look at it incrementally, but thank you for that. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect again to the Minister, whatever he's doing to raise minimum wages is not working, especially for women who face additional barriers. Only 4 to 6 percent of participants in the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Program are women. Fewer still are African Nova Scotia or Indigenous. And with this government, 
freezing and legislating collective agreements left, right and centre, I wonder if the good wages of the labour movement that have been won for nurses, teachers and other jobs traditionally held by women will be stripped away just like their collective bargaining rights have been. Mr. Speaker, based on this record, how can the Minister of Labour possibly claim that his government is looking out for women as workers? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, looking out for, for female workers is, is exactly what this government is doing. It's ironic, Mr. Speaker. On one hand, we're talking about minimum wage workers. On the other hand, we're talking about professions that earn double or triple what the median income is in this province. Mr. Speaker, the median income in this province is $33,000. We're talking about professions that the honourable member is saying are being attacked, who are making double and triple that. But, Mr. Speaker, they weren't attacked. Mr. Speaker, those professions received a pay raise under this government. But what they did not do, Mr. Speaker, is receive a 2% HST hike that wiped out all of the pay increases the NDP gave them. The honourable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. First off, I want to take a moment and thank the Minister for his assistance in the situation yesterday regarding the poor air quality at Ian Forsyth Elementary School in Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, parents in my community want another test conducted in order to determine that there is no benzene along with uh, figuring out the problems with the ventilation system. They are asking uh, for an, a new analysis and proposed solutions to be available to them as soon as possible. My question today to the Minister is simple, and I would like to know, as my constituents want to know, uh, an update on whether or not additional testing took place yesterday, and if it did not, when will it take place? Thank Donald you, Mr. Minister Speaker. Of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, this is an issue of, uh, of, of great concern. Any potential threat to the health of our uh, students and our professionals who work in our schools needs to have immediate attention. Uh, I've, I've been under the impression, I was informed by the uh, regional office that there was additional sampling being done. I've not seen the results of those yet, but as we indicated yesterday publicly, as soon as those are made available, we will ensure the public is well aware of what the outcome was. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, I worry that the situation yesterday in my community is a sign of things to come. In the very near future, in a situation like the, ones, uh, the one parents faced yesterday in Dartmouth East, the chain of command to find answers will, will become murky. The HRSB was a source of information yesterday. My question uh, for the Minister is this. Where do parents turn for answers once school boards are gone? Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Speaker. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as happened um, yesterday, the, the operational leads in our system were the ones that uh, took charge of the situation. This is an operational issue, obviously, and those folks are still going to be there to address these concerns as they have to inform the department and also inform the public. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question again today is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. On Tuesday, I asked the Minister if Cobblecook Community Health Centre was part of the QE2 redevelopment plan and kind of got a bit of a vague answer there. Uh, the people of Sackville are still left wondering whether or not are wandering from facility f to facility when they have a health care crisis in Sackville after hours. The people of Hans County have received upgrades to the Hans Community Hospital. Dartmouth General are getting additions to Dartmouth General. I'm sorry to ask the minister again, but will the minister please stop ignoring the health concerns of the residents of Sackville and tell them once and for all if there will be improved services at Cobbacook Community Health Centre. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank the member for uh, the question. Uh, as it indicated, the uh, work of the QE2 redevelopment is uh, comprehensive, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the uh, primary uh, initiatives there is looking at how uh, the services being delivered are uh, not just replaced with a mirror image of what was there serving Nova Scotians for the past 50 years, Mr. Speaker, but doing a comprehensive review of those uh, services and the services that are going to be needed for the next 50 years. Uh, that work is ongoing. Some of the work is already begun. Uh, the member mentioned some of the, that work, including the uh, recently announced opening of uh, operating rooms in uh, Hans and work done at Dartmouth General, and they can look forward to uh, more announcements uh, in uh, the time to come. 
The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister. Look, I know people who've arrived at Cobbacook Community Health Centre only to be turned away because they were either just closing or had closed. They're sent into emergency rooms at the QE2 Health Science Centre where they have to wait for hours to get help. However, Sackville's got a relatively modern facility. It's only limited by staffing and lacking of some services that are there. Cobbacook Community Health Centre needs some upgrades to assess uh, to offer food services to accommodate patients and to expand to accommodate more services. The facility could certainly relieve the pressures and traffic um, waiting times that are offered by by offering more of these services. I've got to ask again, will the minister please give a direct yes or no answer and commit today to reviewing the funding needed to expand services at Sackville Cobbacook Sackville Community <clears throat> Health Centre. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've uh, previously indicated, and I'll uh, say again, uh, the work uh, to review for the QE2 redevelopment, uh, looking at the services uh, provided uh, for Nova Scotians uh, uh, to bring those services forward and to uh, enhance those services, ensure we have the uh, infrastructure in place and the staffing to support those needs, uh, not based upon a mirror of what happened in the last 50 years, Mr. Speaker, but looking uh, forward to the next 50 years of health care needs in this province. Uh, those reviews uh, have been ongoing. Uh, the work uh, continues as we've uh, made decisions on specific uh, pieces of work. Uh, we've moved forward with those projects. We've been able to announce the start as well as the completion of some of those uh, initiatives and we're continuing to do that Mr. Speaker. Uh, as part of the overall review, if something uh, related to the member's uh, riding comes up, uh, he'll certainly be made and his constituents well aware of that. The Honourable Member for Inverness. For the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education, last month we learned the nature of a 2012 loan to Acadia University. The 2.7 million earmarked to renovate Cutton House didn't come from the Department of Labour and Advanced Education, but from the Dep Budget of Housing Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, when Labour and Advanced Education was asked why the original announcement was in why they made the original announcement instead of the Department of Community Services, they refused an interview, and I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, while this, the secret loan was made under a previous government, this government is now responsible for these departments. Nova Scotians are owed a full explanation. Why won't the minister explain why money from a department with a mandate to support affordable housing for low-income families secretly used that money for another purpose? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, the member actually premised the question perfectly. The loan was done by a previous government. It wasn't our government that did that loan. Mr. Speaker, that loan should never have been made. I agree with the member 100%. The previous government should not be taking money from housing to give to universities. As well, Mr. Speaker, there's another loan which was done to Acadia University, which was a SOFI loan, which was supposed to be for infrastructure, but it went to operations. That should have never been done either. So, Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, why that loan was done, the member would have to ask the previous government. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the Minister is going to say that he does not have access to the people who worked in the Department at the time to explain what happened, that's what we're asking for here, Mr. Speaker, and Nova Scotians deserve a full explanation. Mr. Speaker, what is going on? We have a $7 million Education Department loan forgiven to Acadia, then a loan from Housing with money approved right here in the Legislature, with an understanding that it was money when, we, when it was uh, approved in the legislature, we understood that it was money for affordable housing. So, Mr. Speaker, I am an ex-man, and I don't want to appear to have an axe to grind here. But, Mr. Speaker, if we know that the minister hasn't been entirely forthcoming in the past, and his, I'll table his comments were different from the premiers on this, um, how do we, can we be certain that there aren't other unusual funding patterns <clears throat> waiting to come to, the, come to the fore? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I assure the member that under this government, the um, the accounting um, the accounting procedures that were done from the previous government are not being done. Mr. Speaker, I saw a lot of irregularities when I came into government. As the minister of the Public Service Commission, there was a million dollars that was not budgeted for, but yet we had no incremental areas where that money could come from. But we still had. Uh, full complement of employees to pay for. Mr. Speaker, I saw something which sickened me, which was under the previous government, a whole month of income assistance was eliminated so that they could balance the budget. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say this government restored the income assistance. 
So as I've said, Mr. Speaker, in that, that previous government, 11 months of income assistance, not 12 for their last budget, balanced on the back the of income assistance recipients. Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. In January, Order, please. the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. In January, women on the South Shore were faced with the sudden loss of their midwifery services. But really, the Department of Health and Wellness should have known that the collapse was coming because before its suspension, the South Shore practice was turning away as many as 10 women seeking care each month. <coughs> Registered midwife Leslie Niblett was on call 24-7 for eight months without relief before she had to take a leave from her position back in October, which created the domino effect that forced the other midwife to take a break as well. Mr. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why he did not intervene and bring in additional support to avoid shutdown of the program and ensure that pregnant women were getting the primary health care they needed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, bringing the question to the floor of the House. I think it's important, Mr. Speaker, to recognize that uh, the work uh, of the midwives that were being provided, uh, not just on the South Shore, but indeed in uh, in the Metro Central Region as well as Anakinish, uh, is is valued work, Mr. Speaker, valued by uh, the government, valued by those uh, women and families uh, receiving uh, the care and services being provided. Uh, when uh, the situation on the South Shore is brought to my attention, Mr. Speaker, we did respond. Uh, uh, we responded by uh, expanding the complement there, posting additional uh, position uh, to bring the uh, complement uh, not just on South Shore but also in Anakinish uh, to ensure that these services are continued and sustainable. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, that does not explain why the response was not done before a crisis was averted. But in 2011, a government report re recommended hiring 20 full-time midwives by 2017, and it's now 2018. So the, Fe the Health Minister's February commitment will only bring our total to 11. That's just barely more than half of what we need. Midwives are cost-effective, efficient, and, patient and a patient-focused way to provide primary care. That is recognized in Alberta, BC, and Ontario. Those provinces have hired hundreds of midwives to ensure that all women can get the care they need and want during and after their pregnancies. Yet in Nova Scotia, we're still stuck in the pilot phase where there is no access to midwifery care in the Annapolis Valley or on Cape Breton Island. Can the Minister of Health explain why, at this time when we're facing a serious <coughs> shortage of doctors, he has not expanded midwifery care across the province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank the, the member for the question. Uh, as I've uh, responded to my previous question, we uh, share and recognize the value of the services provided by midwives uh, to those uh, women and uh, families uh, who uh, take advantage of the services that they offer. Uh, the uh, outcomes and the satisfaction of their services are, are well documented, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's why uh, we expanded uh, the uh, complement of midwives. Uh, the NSHA has uh, added additional complements at the uh, practices on the South Shore, as well as in Anakinish uh, uh, back in February, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I had the uh, the opportunity to meet with the uh, president of the Midwifery Association of Nova Scotia. We had a great meeting, Mr. Speaker, and we're committed to continue to work with her and her organization uh, on uh, midwifery services in the province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. In January 2016, the Premier announced a new arena complex for Windsor and it would be getting three million from the province. The investment was to be matched by one million from West Hants, Windsor and King's Edge Hill School. The Deputy Minister of Communications, Culture and Heritage repeated this commitment and stated that it came from the CCH budget. Since the amount uh, of 150,000 max is being exceeded, uh, could the minister explain the source of the arena funding? The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the, uh, the member uh, for the question. And he's obviously talking about a uh, community that is uh, uh, in need of a uh, new arena, a new facility, especially when we talk about Windsor as the birthplace of hockey and uh, the need to uh, have this... Uh, 
and uh, the need to have a first class uh, facility to make sure that the uh, Hockey Heritage Museum uh, continues uh, as well very strongly in the community. In terms of the funding, uh, we're very pleased uh, to, uh, to have available to the community uh, $3 million for this facility and that offer obviously stands. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, my information is that the original plan for the new Windsor Arena complex included the Hockey Heritage Museum. Uh, we've learned that this museum is no longer a part of the plan. Uh, is there going to be funding taken away from the arena of the three million or is extra money going to be found for the uh, Hockey Heritage Museum? The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as we know, uh, negotiations uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the arena bill uh, still still going on. Uh, the uh, both uh, both Windsor uh, and the county uh, uh, remain uh, looking at uh, the uh, the best location. Uh, and uh, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, there's one thing that's certain: the Hockey Heritage Museum uh, in that community will be supported. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. My question is to the Minister of Finance. It has come to no surprise to anyone in this House that the people of Cumberland County have been paying more than their fair share of tax over the last 20 years with the Cobbequid tolls. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired.